Welcome to the D6 Family Ministry Podcast, a place where ideas, principles, and personalities come together to give you a ministry advantage that empowers the church and home. I don't know anything more important in our society or in the kingdom of God than to help the church help the family. Discipleship is not an event, it's a way of life. And one day it just hit me that discipleship at home was not about doing more. It was about inviting Christ into what we were already doing. The goal of family ministry is not families sitting on the couch, holding hands and singing Kumbaya. The ultimate goal is families that love God, love people and make disciples of all peoples. So that's why you're here. You're here to say one hour a week, as significant and as awesome as it is, we know that it's not enough and we want to be intentional with every hour. You're listening to the D6 Podcast. Here are your hosts, Marianne Howard, Ron Hunter, and Josh Wooten. I'm super excited about our guest today, Sean Sweet. He, um, I don't want to give everything away, but he gives a very powerful illustration regarding a bicycle. And it just uh, reminded me of my youth and my love for bikes. I grew up in the 80s and we were the rad generation. We had the BMX bikes and used to race BMX bikes and try to do uh, tricks that we weren't quite qualified to do for tricks. And I've had to explain that several times in my life because I have a line a scar that goes along my face that, you know, most time when people first meet me, it can be, well, how did you get that scar on your face? And it was because uh, not looking before I jumped uh, on a bike and yeah, just look before you leap kids. So uh, speaking of bikes, Marianne, were you into bikes when you were a little girl? Did you ride? Oh, you know, it. eighties and nineties, your bike was your ride. It was a part yeah. of your life. I had a hot pink Huffy with an extra long seat and streamers coming off of my handlebars and there was lots of adventure i even rode with my jam box until you know walkmans came out because cassettes were your life too mixtapes and so yes my my pink huffy uh we we share a lot of life <laughs> that's awesome well i'm of the generation just slightly older than both of you i was in the 70s and mountain bikes weren't around at that point so we had oh. as i look back at the pictures it was the coolest bike in the world to me now but it looks pretty dorky looking back now but i had one of those long banana seats on my bike not oh. one of those small seats and uh yeah we we had a blast and the friends of mine in, in our neighborhood were always riding everywhere we thought it was the coolest thing uh, but the, the bikes have gotten much better, much more cool, but the illustrations of how they work and how we learn to ride them never change, do they, regardless of what they look like. And, and that's what uh, Josh was referring to. And we want to we wanna jump in and hear Sean on uh, his advice, his direction on middle school ministry. And um, there's been nobody, kind of like uh, uh, Larry Fowler, and a handful of others carving out that niche in grandparenting ministry, Sean Sweet has carved out this niche in middle school ministry. And so if you are uh, very, very concerned as you should be about that specific group of kids, you need to keep Sean's resources, his websites available for you, the books that he recommends for your volunteers that work with him. And when we come back from this break, we're gonna let Sean just tutor us on middle school ministry. Hey everybody, it's your good friend, Pastor Steve with the Elements Kids Worship Team. Elements Kids Worship is a completely downloadable 52-week curriculum for use in your church with either midweek programming, kids' church hour, or even with small groups. Through Elements, kids experience deeper growth and understanding of what it means to walk with Christ. This is accomplished by teaching firm biblical truths and emphasizing the need for kids to not only understand what the Bible says, but to apply it to their own personal lives. Elements Kids Worship is a valuable and economical tool for your church to use to impact kids with the elemental truths of God's Word. Oh, hey, one more thing. Be sure to head over to d6family.com to check out Elements Kids Worship for yourself. We 
are live at the D6 conference in Orlando, Florida, and I am joined today by Sean Sweet. For 25 years, Sean Sweet has been a passionate advocate for preteens, both as a public school teacher and in church-based ministry. He currently serves dual roles as preteen pastor at Destiny Church in Rockland, California, and community director at 456.org, which educates, trains, and resources preteen ministry leaders around the world. Sean lives in Sacramento with his wife, Dana, and their three amazing kids. Sean, thanks so much for being at at the D6 conference and for joining me today. Oh, it's great to be in person with yes. people. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> we're talking about preteen ministry today. Yes. What is it that draws you to this age group in particular? Yeah, um, you know, some people are called to China or you know, <laughs> Siberia or whatever I, and I feel um, uh, I am called. I'm called to this age group. Um and that's that's kind of the, the short answer is that God mm-hmm. has called me to this age group. I have an understanding of them um, that really um, goes beyond, I think, where where a lot of churches have preteens. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I served um, at the church that I'm at. I, I served there since the time I was a Christian, shortly after. I mm-hmm. uh, became a Christian in college. And I went to college to become a child, uh, to become a um, school teacher. So even then, I, I was you know I knew I wanted to do something with kids. Uh, and as I got into student teaching, I was just drawn towards that older age group mm-hmm. because of where they were um, mentally, like how they could process and think, and the conversations that I could have with them. I simply couldn't have those conversations with a second grader mm-hmm. or first grader because developmentally they're not there. Yeah. So after teaching uh, for seven years. Um, and in there, I, I gave my heart to the Lord. Um, my mom actually started attending church. She mm-hmm. gave me a Bible, and I read the Bible, and I was actually reading it to make better fun of the Christians. Mm. Uh, I wanted to read all the holes and the flaws and the way that they thought, because um, I had made fun of Christians in high school. Mm. And I thought, you know, I really should find out what they think so I can do a better job of insulting them. And, wow. And, um, yeah, so I started reading the scriptures from the beginning and gave my heart to the Lord. That's so awesome. I was starting to serve in the church. I was um, a school teacher and really uh, figured out how to communicate with, with fifth graders, how to educate them, how to help them to grow in their math abilities, <laughs> their reading <laughs> abilities, and their thinking abilities. Mm-hmm. Um, and as that was happening, I was becoming more and more involved at our church mm. in the children's ministry. When our children's pastor uh, left the church, he, he he actually became Bible man. I don't know if you've ever heard of uh-huh, Bible man. Yeah. Yeah. So when Willie course. Ames left, uh, Robert T. Schlipp, our children's pastor, became. The, it's so funny because like there's videos with a picture of our children's pastor yes, as Bible yeah. man. Uh, so you know he put on the spandex and, and left. Oh my gosh, that's hilarious! <laughs> I love that. But what a cool opportunity, it you know, was. for your kids to see that too. Uh, yeah. After. Yeah. Oh, it was great. Yeah. yeah, it was great for the church, and yeah. we celebrated him doing that, and you know it was wonderful and. I had, uh, you know, I had become more and more involved mm. and it just, you know how God works. These, these things happen. My mom was sitting behind the senior pastor's secretary when he made the announcement from the stage and she leaned over to my dad and said, Sean would be great at, at that job. Well, the secretary heard that Uh-oh. and Busted. the next thing I know, I'm getting a call from the senior pastor <laughs> saying, Hey, do you want to? Uh, come and be the children's pastor. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was a school teacher. I had tenure. And uh, he's like, do you want to, you know, he called me. Do you want to meet for coffee? I'm like, okay. <laughs> a little nervous when your senior pastor calls right. and asks that, right? <laughs> uh, and so we met and he said, hey, would you like to come on staff? Uh, and I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let me run first. <laughs> Let me give you three reasons why <laughs> yeah. as a school teacher, June, July, and August. <laughs> There's three reasons right there. But then the Lord just... The next day, I couldn't rest. I couldn't Mm -hmm. rest with that decision. I came on staff. I was over birth through fifth grade. Wow. And I had first through fifth graders all together in one space. And I just knew this is not, this is not um, the most conducive Mm -hmm. because I know preteens. I know how to communicate with them. But when I do that, the first graders are lost. Right. Mm -hmm. And when I try to, uh, pander is the wrong word, but communicate with the first graders, the fifth graders are not 
They're not engaging it, with that, I'm right, sure. Right, exactly. And, you know, people would always say, just aim for the oldest kids. Aim for the older elementary and the younger will come along. And I, what I realized was if I want to entertain them, yes. If I want to tell them a compelling story, yes. But if I wanted to disciple them in intentional mm. ways um, that match where they are developmentally, we have to take a different approach. Mm -hmm. And preteens are developmentally very different mm -hmm. than younger than their younger selves. Yeah. Well, they're also a lot different than when we were preteens. Uh, I mean, preteens in 2021, yeah. they're at a, a completely different level than we were and mm -hmm. have different things that they're struggling with and opportunities. How have you seen mm -hmm. preteen ministry change over the last few years, and yeah. where is it heading? You know what's really interesting is that even from the time that I started working with preteens till now, they're the same in a lot of ways. So it's like the same boat, just different waters mm. that they're mm -hmm. that they're navigating. Yeah. But it's the same boat. They're they're developmentally what's going on is very similar to what was going on. Now, granted, there is research that shows that because of screen time, their development is actually um, slowed down mm. um, by some of those things. But at the same time, they, uh, and this will kind of answer your question, that at the same time, because of all the exposure with, uh, with the phone to social media and to YouTube and to all those things, they're more attracted to teenage culture mm -hmm. than they were. Mm -hmm. but they're less ready to step into it mm -hmm. than they were. Yeah. So they're less equipped and more eager to grow up, if that makes, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think there's, there's a, a loss for them um, in the last 25 years with the digitization of, um, of kids. Mm -hmm. um, there's a loss in the um, communities that they would grow from being a part of. Mm -hmm. There's a, a loss from the parent connection because parents are on their phones too. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a parent on my phone, you know. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, and then there is the whatever the effects are that the screen time has on the brain. So I think um, there's a more of a need than ever mm -hmm. um, for preteen ministry. There's, yeah. There's preteens have always needed something different if we're going to help them in their growth. Um, but I think that need has been, uh, has come more to the forefront and, and we're mm -hmm. seeing it at churches, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if your church has a preteen ministry, but we do we see do. more and more and more. That's a norm. Whereas 10 years ago, um, you know, that wasn't, it wasn't, really that wasn't the, the norm. Right. Yeah. Right. What would you say are some of the most critical issues that parents of preteens are dealing with right mm -hmm. now? Uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of it um, has to do with uh, exposure to uh, and access, exposure and access. So preteens are exposed to things they are not ready for mm -hmm. uh, at earlier ages, and um, yeah, and they they have and they have access, right? Like. Mm -hmm. Um, many of the preteens in my ministry walk in with a cell phone in their pocket. Hmm. And it's like they have, um, <clears throat> if there's no filters on that thing, they've they got the world in their pocket. Mm -hmm. Like, is that really a, a good thing? <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I mean, but in thinking about where they are and talking about developmentally, uh, I got to hear um, part of what you were saying yesterday in your breakout that, hmm. They're just not ready for that. They're yeah. exposed to it, just not ready. Right. And to have that at their fingertips, how do we navigate that as parents? How do we uh, be able to set a standard? What are some things that we need to have in place yeah. uh, in order to make sure there's security around them? Right, because the, the other struggle is that they are ready in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. They're they're ready to start taking steps of faith ownership. They're ready to start taking steps of, um, of ownership of all different aspects of their lives. They're ready developmentally, but not experientially. Mm -hmm. So what we can do to help preteens is uh, what we call it four, five, six. We call it let go of the bike and run beside. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea is when you're teaching somebody to ride a bike, there comes a point where you have to let go. Mm -hmm. But you don't typically let just let go. You also run alongside. Right. Uh, today in the uh, breakout I did, I asked um, 
I said, what, what, what do you do when you teach somebody to ride a bike? You let go, and what else do you do? And they say, run beside. And I said, okay, but why? Well, because they, they might fall. And, I'm, and then I said, so why did you let go? Hmm. Right? Yeah. But we know the answer. Like, intuitive, we know we have to let go, or else they're never going to take... That bike is never going to become theirs. Right. And when it comes to faith and when it comes to their life, we need to let go and allow them to take ownership. But at the same time, we don't just let go. Mm -hmm. We run alongside. Yeah. So I think both are critical for the preteen years. We're talking about safety and protecting them and all those things. That's the running beside part. But if that's all we're doing, then there's something missing in that equation too. Mm -hmm. Right. We have to let them figure these things out mm. um, on their own, but not on their own. Right. We have to allow them to, to think they're <laughs> figuring it out. <laughs> sure, yeah. Well, and they are. I mean, they're, they're working it out. Yeah, and but, they're making mistakes with us right, right there next to them. It's messy. Yeah. I, mean, I have three You're kids, right. and the youngest is 10. I've got so a 13 right there in that and a 16. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. And, you know... Those preteen years were were a little bit messy, mm -hmm. and we just kind of smiled through it and uh, realized <laughs> they're working their way through it. Both both of my daughters, and they're both so so different, um, and just the way they navigated it. But the whole thing is, we're moving from uh, I think uh, D six uh, the the C's of parenting. We've mm -hmm. got the cop stage, and mm -hmm. then we have the the coaching stage, mm -hmm. and I think when you enter those preteen years, there's an overlap. Mm -hmm. You you got to do both in good measure. Mm -hmm. You're right. you're providing challenge and freedom, but you're also providing protection, and and that's what the letting go and running beside philosophy is all about. Yeah, um, and that's the heartbeat of four, five, six, and it, that hasn't changed. It, you know. Yeah. Even through COVID, even through the. Uh, all the th all the things that we've faced and that kids have faced, this strategy with preteens still works and still ministers. Um, you know, our Zoom services <laughs> and the ways that we minister to preteens continued to be all about empowering them to take ownership of their faith mm -hmm. and being somebody who's being, you know, being a community that's running alongside as they're figuring out how to take ownership of their faith. Yeah. Um, how can parents biblically address those critical issues that you've just been talking about? Mm -hmm. And how can, like you just said, how can the church come alongside them and support and encourage those parents as they are trying to let go of that right. bike, as you said? Yeah. So um, we've been working on this. We have been working on the answer to that question. And that's, I think, um, that is a well that is really, really deep. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've discovered some strategies, some ways of doing it. In fact, uh, we just came out with a book, Let Go and Run Beside, mm -hmm. and it's got 10 essentials of preteen ministry, but it's not the end of the well. Mm -hmm. um, so there are several ways in there, and I'll just mention a few. Yeah, please. One is um, kind of a switch to questioning, using questions to disciple. Mm -hmm. So... This is a stage where we can start to ask them questions and allow them to find answers. And if their answers are, are off base, we can ask questions to help poke holes in their answers that mm -hmm. they're giving. Because let's be honest, they've asked us a thousand questions yes. <laughs> at that yes. point, right? By the time they're a preteen, we're asking or we're answering all the silly questions. And so right. now it's their turn, right? Yeah. And, and the approach with our small group leaders really changes and shifts mm -hmm. at, at church. And this is also true in, in parenting that kids ask us questions and we give them answers. When we start to enter the preteen years, they ask a question and what our small group leaders know to do <clears throat> is to say, what do you think? Mm -hmm. And then a lot of times they'll be right on with mm -hmm. their answer. So do you train, I'm sorry to interject no, yeah, while you're talking about <laughs> this, but you train your volunteers and your small group leaders in that way? Yes. How does that, how does that take place? So we just when we have new leaders come in, mm -hmm. uh, it's a common thing in our training times, in our prayer times. Hey, if, remember, if kids ask, when kids ask questions in your small group, respond first by asking them what they think. Excellent. And then if they don't know, if they say, I don't know, the next step is to ask the group. Mm. Does any, 
Does anybody else have an answer? Mm -hmm. So what we're teaching them, I'm I'm really big on the method is the message. Mm -hmm. Um, What we're teaching them is that they can start to pursue these things themselves Mm -hmm. and we're there to help them if they're going off track. Mm -hmm. So if an answer is wackadoodle, you know, (laughs) (laughs) uh, then we can be there to, uh, to help guide them back on point. Yeah. But I want to give you a quick example of what this kind of method does. So on Wednesday night, uh, we let our kids write two questions, or we give them two questions, and then we send them to small groups. Mm -hmm. And the two questions are, what is God showing you through tonight's message? And what questions do you have after tonight's message? Mm -hmm. They write their answers to those, and they go to their small groups. So uh, I love to tell the story of this kid. He entered our ministry, and he was like immature, not ready to engage, and he just was like, you know, just, uh, and it was like, come on, you know, trying to You're get him trying. involved. Yeah. He was in my small group. And I'll never forget the night we taught, taught about Jesus when he was 12. We taught about Jesus in the temple. And um, that we told that story and we let the kids write the answer, you know, what is God revealing to you and what questions do you have? Mm-hmm. We get to the small group. And, you know, his paper would always just have holes poked in it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. But one of the other boys <laughs> in the group asked, um, did Jesus have friends when he was a preteen? Mm. And I said, what do you think? And the kid said, I don't know. And so I said, does anybody else have an answer? And this kid who had been tuned out since the time he got there, he woke up and he said, I bet he didn't have a lot of friends because kids that are different, people don't like them. Hmm. Something changed in him that night. I think Mm. he made a connection with Jesus. Because he was really talking about himself. Correct. And yeah. he was seeing, he was understanding what it meant to be, like he was making a connection with Jesus because Jesus was different. Mm-hmm. That's right. And this kid felt different too. Well, fast forward to when he's a sixth grader. He's in our leadership program. Hmm. He's totally involved. He loves the Lord. He's, he's like leading the other kids in worship. That's awesome. And that wouldn't have happened if we didn't make room for the kids to ask their questions mm-hmm. and to answer one another. Yeah. So that's just one of the one of the techniques that parents can use, that we can use in ministry. And, um, you know, it, the book outlines like 10 different things that we can do to, to let go and run beside. Now, I have a question because I have a couple of preteens in my own home. Okay. okay? So congratulations. They are, <laughs> the, the thing that, I, yeah, congratulations, I've made it. Uh, <laughs> the thing that um, I find myself uh, the place I find myself with these boys is they think uh, that they can have an adult conversation, uh-huh. right? Uh-huh. And they want to, they still yes. want to be kids and yeah. they still want to play and they w- want to be really weird, <laughs> which they're really good at. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, they're kind of stuck in the middle. Right. Um, how do you not... Like squelch that, you know, like desire to have adult conversation and, you know, be with more mature people, but also kind of tenderly help them to realize they are still kids. Like, how do you find that balance, I guess you would say? So I did an experiment once with the preteens in our ministry, and I asked them, do your parents treat you too old or too young? Mm -hmm. And they wrote down their name and their answer. And then two weeks later, I asked the same group of kids the same question. Do you know how many of them switched <laughs> their answer? Okay. Hey, well, that makes me feel better. <laughs> it, it was it was amazing to me. I you know I I was curious to see uh, wh- how they felt they were being treated at home, mm-hmm. and I was looking at the answers. I'm going, huh? So I asked them again in two weeks and got like totally different answers, That's even hilarious. from the same kids. And I think there is that what you what exactly what you're perceiving with your kids like. There is a desire to grow up, and not only just a desire, but a mental, cognitive ability to do things they couldn't do, right. like even a month ago, two uh-huh. months ago. Changing all Isn't, the time. Doesn't your, <laughs> I don't know if your kids do this. Uh, they probably do because they're preteens. Do they surprise you sometimes with oh, like a thousand percent? What? Yeah, I'm sorry. Who are yeah. you? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'll never forget my uh, boy in fourth grade. He he's reading this book called Janwar's Bridge, uh, and it was about a, um, a dragon, and the dragon uh, created a bridge across the river. But what also happened is that he was creating a bridge between the father and the son. 
mm-hmm. in the story. Well, Daniel got that, which he would not have gotten even a year earlier. Mm-hmm. And then he looks at me and he says, huh, teachers are like dragons. And I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> he goes, they connect you with things that you need to learn. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Okay, Daniel. <laughs> yes. Teachers are like a bridge. I hear <laughs> you're what right. you're saying. Yeah. So uh, when, when my kids, you know, when they would do that, and they'd come and sit at the, at the, at the adult table, <laughs> you know, and then get bored and walk away. Right, whatever. yeah. But when they're there, I, I try to give them the dignity of like, okay, you want to try this on? Mm-hmm. Great. That's awesome. You know? Yeah. Like, if no one laughs at your jokes, don't yeah. be offended. Right. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, um, there's this great, weird. great article. Uh, I recommend it as, if you're a parent of preteens. Yeah. It's, Give us some resources. It's the AMLE's Characteristics of Early Adolescence. Hmm. Um, it's fantastic. And they go into mental development, physical development, social development, moral and spiritual development. Um, and they take the research from the last like 50, 60 years and compiled it into this amazing article. And one of the things they say, you mentioned humor, mm-hmm. is, is that they're developing the ability at, at, you know, 10 to 15 is what they were looking at. All the research on 10 to 15 year olds, they're developing the ability for more sophisticated uh, humor. Mm-hmm. But, they, but just like we talked about with the bike and everything, they're ready developmentally, but not experientially. Not the experience, yeah. So give them the experience and laugh at their, you know... <laughs> Like, what did oh, you do? we do plenty of laughing. Yeah. <laughs> what did you do when they were two and they, they, you know, got up on the edge of the table and walked and fell? We, we, oh, we man, we applauded. Exactly, yes, we right? Did. And, and if we can take that approach with preteens, I know it's harder because they're, like, saying inappropriate things or, <laughs> like, doing stuff. But it really is the same. It's, yeah. it's like they've grown this new set of wings and, I mean, what would you do if you grew in a set of wings? Oh, I'd be trying to fly. Exactly. That's and, right. And then you'd be knocking this, you know, you'd be knocking things <laughs> off the table and yeah. and stuff. But um, that's what's going on with their mental ability. So I encourage it and, and smile at it and like, oh, you want to have an adult conversation? Let's do it. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And and then they'll go run off and, you know. Yeah, and do weird things yeah. and make up a weird dance and right. all the things. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Well, Sean, thank you so much for everything you shared with us today. I appreciate it. And as a mom of preteens, I genuinely appreciate the conversation. Oh, thank so thank you for what you're doing for the kingdom. Thank you very much. What an interesting story um, uh, and, and such incredible insight. But even in the way that he was called into ministry, I, I connected with that podcast right from the get go. Uh, he and I both uh, were, Sir Sean uh, and I both started, it looks like, got into ministry by just simply volunteering. And then our children's pastor stepped away. Now, mine was not Bible man. But <laughs> it was very interesting um, in the way that, that he got called into ministry and, and tried to go reluctantly at first and, and said no. And I, I did the same thing, but then realized that um, when God calls you, in other words, if thus saith the Lord, yes, saith the Josh. And um, here I am 20 years later, but I just thoroughly um, gleaned a lot of wisdom as somebody who works in middle school ministry right now, uh, myself, I'm in the acting, not only lead pastor of next generation ministries, but I'm currently serving as our middle school pastor. And so I, I was taking lots of notes and um, it just is really good insight and eye opening perspective for me to be able to not try to fix things, let them figure some of the stuff out because so often in human nature, when we see somebody doing things or, headed a direction they shouldn't go. You want to jump in and fix, but I love the the way he said, you just got to let them go and figure some stuff out for themselves and kind of step aside and observe and, and coach, but, but not do it all for them. I uh, totally agreed. In fact, that was my big, big fun takeaway from that when he said that they are ready developmentally but not experientially. And, and you're right, Josh, that was, that was my real, to let them work through it with some trial and error. And I think, you know, what we need to be reminded of as parents is that you want your kids to fail on the small things early when you're around and can help them. 
than for them to never have bumped into these pain points until they've left home and then they fail and they're scared to tell you. They're scared to, you know, bring that out. And those failures are typically far bigger than the ones that middle schoolers are going to face. This interview really struck me as a parent. I'm raising a 10 year old right now. And so he's right there um, Uh in the middle of it. And he talked about the concerns of digitization and the loss of parent connection and the loss of community connection. And that, that kind of made my heart stop of just, man, am I doing everything I possibly can to fight for his heart? And he restated this, I think, a couple times in the podcast conversation that we've got to empower them to take ownership of their faith. That's our place as parents and ministry leaders is we want them to own their faith. Um, And so I just he is really gifted. He is. um, I love that he has a heart for that age. I think it matters because I think there is something developmentally happening between children's ministry and student ministry that it's a strategic time to capture their minds and their hearts um, as they own their faith. Very, very much so. And, and, you know, that's the hardest thing in the world as parents to step away and let, you know, that that area. It's so hard because we certainly don't want to see our kids hurt or or the pain areas that that they will face. But you know what? They're grasping at the next level. Every child for every age is grasping to the next level. Our job is to prep them, not do for them, them, not do for them. And, uh, and, and work it along, watch them. The only way we really get real experience is tactically, hands-on, working it out, trial and error. Um, I had to miss a whole lot of hoops in the backyard before I started making those basketball shots. And the same principles of sports apply in life. They're going to have to miss some shots in order to get them right. And uh, we can just cover think- that. I think, too, something that he reiterated towards the end as he was talking through practical ways, and Ron, I know this is a big passion of yours and you practice this as a father, but question asking. You know, he just said with middle schoolers, you need to start asking questions, and when they're not, when they don't answer in the right direction, you you poke holes by asking more questions to help them flesh out where they're going. Um, And so I really loved his suggestion on asking questions. So I'm already thinking as a mom with my post-it notes as me and Zeke are driving in the car shoulder to shoulder, thinking about what questions I can be asking of him just to know his heart. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I think that's vital. And, uh, you know, as we look forward even to next week's podcast, we're going to continue this development process with our guest, Matt Markins, who talks about that power of the involved adults and what it does to develop one's worldview and, and value-based thinking. How does that get developed? So Sean is really perfect segue into our next week's guest, uh, Matt Markins. And so until then, we're going to ask that you look for uh, ways you can engage your kiddos with questions. Allow them the experience to, to, uh, to fail. Uh, help them work through the failure, get back up, knock it out again, help them understand the ins and outs of it. And uh, remember that our D6 podcast is your um, coaching moment with all these incredible thought leaders that are just brought into your world at your convenience. So please share our podcast with other people, give us feedback along the way, and we look forward to meeting with you again next week. You've been listening to the D6 Podcast. You can learn more about D6 at d6family.com. 